Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll make a start. Welcome to the London Media Centre. My name is Sarah Jones, and I'll be chairing the briefing this afternoon. With just eight days to go until we host what we hope will be the best ever Olympic Games, we wanted an opportunity to set out how we've turned London into a massive sporting venue. Today's briefing will focus on the architecture, design and construction of the London 2012 venues. We've put together a diverse panel here for you today who'll tell the stories behind the London 2012 building programme, the groundbreaking engineering that lies behind these structures and what our Olympic venues say about construction and design in the UK today. Dennis, over to you. Hi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as, uh, as it says up there, I'm Dennis Hine. I'm the Chief Executive of the Olympic Delivery Authority. When you look at that film and you see uh, how vibrant the Olympic Park looks with its new venues, it's really hard to believe what it looked like uh, six, seven years ago when the bid was put in. Uh, I've got some images here that I'll show, share with you in terms of uh, what the park looked like, oh, eventually. So we, we had a park that was covered with some 200 industrial buildings, uh, light industry, bus depots. It's crisscrossed with railway lines, canals and waterways. Most of those were inaccessible to the general public. Areas where you can see waterways, there's tyres dumped here. Uh, it, was, it was a real barrier between the communities in the east ends of London and, and the movement of people in those areas. It's a site around two and a half hectares, the same size as Hyde Park in the centre of London, and yet uh, not, not used by the general public. So it's not the sort of place that you'd, uh, if you were thinking of uh, hosting an Olympic Games and uh, uh, putting in uh, seven billion pounds worth of investment and having to do it against an immovable deadline, it's not the place you'd have chosen to make the task easy. It, but it was a place that was chosen so that uh, um, it would have a legacy benefit, that that money would actually improve an area of London that was crying out for uh, regeneration and, uh, and that level of investment. So at the beginning, uh, when we look at the site, we had the task as the Olympic Delivery Authority to uh, uh, sequence the works, look at how we'd bring it all forward. So we went through, uh, as you'd imagine, a planning and design phase. It was incredibly important in that planning and design phase that we thought about legacy, that we thought about the legacy uses of the park and how they could be improved and the impacts that venues would have in the future. And more than that, we also needed to look at uh, sustainability. We wanted to make sure that things like rainwater harvesting, uh, the materials that were on the site, how they could be reused. We reused 98% of materials on the site. How we put in new utility networks and things. It could all be done in a sustainable way. It was very important that in the design phase that we put that all together. It wasn't... The point I tried to make to a number of people is... Yes, it had to be done on time. Yes, it had to be done within budget. But it was also important that we hit uh, what we call our priority themes. Sustainability, accessibility, legacy. We looked at uh, training and employment initiatives. We had to integrate all of those into this project. Thank you, Dennis. Can I now introduce James Bully, who's the Director of uh, Venues and Infrastructure at LOCOG. Thanks very much and good afternoon everyone. Um, I've got uh, quite a few slides that I'm going to go through but I wanted to give you a real sense of what it's going to take um, in terms of delivering all of the overlay and what all of this means in terms of how it's brought together in terms of its design principles and the reasons for choosing the locations and settings. The scale of what we're delivering here as part of the um, games-wide uh, venue delivery is that we have 34 competition venues and in addition to that, we have 40 training venues plus a number of other um, non-competition sites, uh, villages, accommodation, um, broadcast centres, operational centres, bus depots, logistics centres and so on. Over 120 sites are being delivered as part of the overall operation and uh, the sports venues for the Games. It's the biggest overlay programme that has ever uh, been delivered for an Olympic Games. Much of the design of the stadiums was about, as well, creating a real cauldron atmosphere, keeping spectators very close to the field of play, um, that they had facilities designed specifically you know, to meet their exacting requirements, given what the athletes need to do in terms of preparation and training. We want to provide the very best um, facility and then create the most incredible atmosphere within those spaces. 
That's done by putting seats very close to the field of play, having look applications that create energy and excitement um, and inspiration, really, for the athletes and the audiences watching these sports. So very much um, creating these very exciting bowls around these, these field of play. But let me take you through a quick slideshow of some of the venues off park, because what we've tried to do here is really capture London and create a very special and uh, unique environment for athletes in the backdrop images. So you can see here some of those um, spectacular images. Um, beach volleyball, of course, being built on Horse Guards Parade adjacent to Downing Street. The Hyde Park um, triathlon and marathon swim with the backdrops to Westminster Palace. Lords as a magnificent venue. Um, the turf there, we've uh, actually now built the stands on the hallowed turf of Lords. You can see the sort of imagery that will create at games time. And then, of course, um, Greenwich Park. You know, in the heart of um, that historic park, we built this new arena plus the cross-country course that goes through it. Uh, great, stunning images back to um, the city and Canary Wharf, horses jumping over the Meridian Line. Thank you, James. Uh, over to Philip Johnson, one of the principal architects at Populous um, on the Olympic Stadium. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, a, it's a, a, a great privilege to be here. Yes, I was the project architect for the, the Olympic Stadium, which is a great privilege in my home city. So this is the, the Games Mode master plan with the stadium to the south, which is on the right-hand side of this image. And um, uh, you can see the rivers that, uh, that go through the site from north to south. And then this is the legacy. Uh, the legacy of the park has always been um, one of the main drivers. Of course, we need to get everything right for the Games, but um, the Games is a relatively short-term uh, event, and therefore everything, uh, all the investment needs to be made in, in order to make sure we can regenerate this part of London. As far as the stadium is concerned, of course, it's uh, designed for the athletics and the opening and closing ceremonies. Um, we had an extraordinary, uh, unprecedented brief of course, it needs to be provided for 80,000 people for the uh, opening and closing ceremonies in the athletics. But post-games, our, our brief at the time was to, was to ensure that it could be uh, reduced down to a much smaller capacity for, for community athletic events. Um, as Dennis was mentioning, now that that process is on, ongoing, it's not entirely uh, clear at this stage uh, what the uh, legacy will be, but the stadium has been designed specifically to be flexible that it can accommodate a number of different uses and different scales after post games. Um, but as a result of that brief, the, the, uh, it is probably one of the lightest stages ever built for this, this uh, uh, capacity. The upper tier is effectively a, um, a simple uh, and demountable structure with a very straightforward, um, engineeringly complex but visually straightforward uh, roof that hovers above the, the overall um, seating bowl, the upper tier. And yes, uh, delighted that the building has already won um, some awards, architectural awards, so even before its main use at the Games. Thank you. And finally, to Angela Brady from uh, Reba, the president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and a particularly uh, warm welcome to our international journalists. Um, I'm very proud to be a Londoner, and as you can hear from my accent, I'm part of the uh, diversity of London. Um, I think that the day we won the Olympics, we were so proud to have won that, and the whole thing where you're going to be putting architecture on a world stage. Um, now, as president of the RIBA, I'm delighted to be able to promote the very best of architecture and the very best of our world-class architects. But what's so important is, after the Olympics, what's going to happen then? And right from the start, when we won that bid, it was always going to be good design, it was going to be the promotion of sustainability, and the promotion of the legacy. And the legacy had got to work, so everything that you see now is going to have a long-term life. The, the actual location, as you can see from this plan here, we see the Thames, um, in, it's, it's right in the heart of London. And it was in an area that was in need of regeneration. Because there was a time not so long ago where every, <coughs> every tube stop you went going eastwards was a life of year expectancy. And that's going to change now with this wonderful opportunity to regenerate the heart of London in an area that has been much neglected for years. 
You can see from the, these diagrams that that whole area was ripe for redevelopment, and it actually knits together the east and the west sides of London. And that's a wonderful opportunity, and it's been very well taken up. I think one of the fantastic things for the future is this park. This park will be linked into all of our green chain links. It will be linked into the cycling routes. And even when, when, the, um, when the games was being planned, the riverways were used. So it was very sustainable in transport terms too, and will be again afterwards. But we've got an exhibition at the RIBA which shows the ideas behind the designs. So from the magma shooting um, ring, <laughs> you can see here, to one of my favorite projects is the velodrome. And this time last year, when it was on the shortlist for the Sterling, we actually got to visit this project before it was complete. And to see these projects, you need to go down and see them, to see the beauty of them. This particular project, which is naturally ventilated building, has got a cable structure, very light, very well designed, very economic. And if you see, that if you actually go into these buildings, that is when you, it actually has the impact on you. Looking at pretty pictures is one way, but you have to experience these buildings yourself to see the full impact of them. Another of my favorites is Zaha Hadid's aquatic center. And during the early stages of this, when it was on site, um, it was like, um, you know, we, we, there were some of these bus tours you could go on. Um, and you could just go underneath this whole belly of the building. It was like a giant whale, and you could see the whole metal structure. It was an absolutely amazing building from its early stages right through to now. And once those kind of side wings that do obliterate it quite a bit at the moment, once those side temporary um, stadium extra seating come down, we are going to have one of the most iconic buildings in London. And Zaha did one of our star architects, is a world-class architect. So I really think that this is putting the very best of British architects on a world stage.